right into it. New York Times bestselling author. He has over 20 written books, y'all. And he's taking his books to film, baby. Okay, to the big screen, baby. He might need a sexy little actress like myself, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, <laughs> you have five New York Times bestselling novels. How did you fall in love with writing and storytelling? You know, I'm a movie guy, you know, first off. I wasn't no book writer. You know, I was a typical athlete coming up in Philadelphia. You know, so I was outside all the time. Um, but when I got in trouble, we had a reading session in, in school, in uh, grade school. Yeah. And I had this friend, Albert Branch, who bought comic books at school. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I can read comic books. They had these superheroes with all these superpowers and all that. So I got into reading comic books. Okay. But outside of that, I wasn't reading much of anything. But I was in the movies. And then telling stories, I would be the one that if we went to a party and somebody got in a fight or somebody had an argument, I was the one with all the details. The juice, yeah. the tea, that's what they call it nowadays, the tea. Yeah, so <laughs> if you got any part of the story wrong, I'm like, no, nah, that ain't how I went. Dude got mad because the girl said this and, said, and she was wearing this and he threw the left punch and not the right Damn. punch. So I had all the beat, and then when we went to the movies, I was the one that had all the attention. You know, okay. guys would go to the bathroom five times, buy hot dogs and party popcorn. I'm sitting there watching the movie, so of course they're asking me, yo, what the movie about, what I miss? So I was the one that always had the infant, and then they didn't have attention spans, so I would go and do what I call movie marathons. You go in there, and you got like three movies. <laughs> yeah, this movie ended at 2.30, I'm going to the other joint. So I'd be in there like six hours, yes. and my friends like, I ain't going to the movie at six, so they would watch one movie and leave, and so I always had that attention span, you know, for stories. Yeah. And so when it came time to write my own stories, you know, I just had all the details to make it happen. Yeah. And then once I understood I had that, I didn't want to waste it. Right. You got a lot of people, I call them coulda, woulda, shoulda people. Yeah. Like, I coulda did that. I shoulda did that. I woulda did, you know what I mean? Like, but, <laughs> but you didn't. didn't do it, right? Yeah, you didn't. And so you don't get the credit for none you of that. Absolutely you absolutely know? do not. Yeah, so I, I wanted to make sure I didn't waste the talent that I already have. And you also have to have a good memory. Definitely. And so I got a hell of a memory where I memorize a whole lot of stuff. And I, you know, just like a brain like an elephant. So all the details, they lock in. You know what I mean? Where other people forget stuff. Um, yeah. How did, how did it happen? You know what I mean? I'm like, no, this is how it happened. You okay. Know? So, you definitely yeah. got to have a gift for that. Like, yeah. I mean, anybody could tell you what happened, but you got the the uh, sophistication to tell yeah. the story yeah. to make you want to know more, yeah. to lean in, like, for real? Like, yeah. what else happened? So yeah. that's definitely a gift. Um, so tell me a little bit about your childhood. What was your childhood like? Well, I grew up in West Philadelphia. West Philly in the building, <laughs> baby. And so, you know, I was the oldest of the next generation. My mom was the oldest of eight, and my okay. father was the oldest of four. And they from the baby boom era. I'm not, but when you raise under uncles and aunts and cousins, yeah. I felt like I'm from the baby boom. And then in Philadelphia, you know, you got neighborhoods where you got like 400 people on the block. Wow. So you got all kinds of stories. And since I was this young dude around older people, I was around a lot of stuff I wasn't supposed I to be around. <laughs> and so I'm like, I'm sucking up all this adult stuff, you know yeah. what I mean? So, you know, as they say, you know, like the baby with the adult mind. And so I was around a lot of mature content at a young age. Yeah. And, you know, West Philadelphia, I was in the bottom part, you know, it's like a rougher part. You know, so it was a rough area. We fought all the time, but we loved, you know, we, we were used to it. So that's yeah. what it was. And then I moved to an area called Mount Airy. Okay. And that's where black people moved on up like the Jefferson Show. Hey, you know, I had, got I had grass, I had a driveway, I had my own room. I'm like, yo! And then all the black people up there had driveways and grass, and they, they had a little more <laughs> it money. Was and so we were a little fancy, you know, okay. we fancy, huh? You know what I mean? <laughs> we were fancy in Mount Airy. And so that's where, you know, some of the later fly grow and all that flyness was in Mount Airy. Yeah. You know, but my instinctive personality is West Philly. Okay. But then I got that superficial fly of Mount Airy, so it's like I got them two things going on. Yes, yeah, the know. best of both worlds. Yeah. I like that. So tell me. Um, how do you know a fly girl when you see one? Well, in our day, we were very superficial in Philadelphia. In New York, when they said fly, they can say you got a fly attitude. You a fly person. Okay. We didn't do that in Philly. You had to have gear in Philly. Okay. So we had to see the earrings, the hair, the clothing, the Gucci bag, yes. the Lord Bugatti jeans. You know, you had to have it physically. Like, she put her stuff together. Right. That's fly. 
in New York, it would be like, she's fly, like she got a fly person. And we like, no, nah, dude, you can be cool, but to be fly, you gotta have a gear. Okay. And so in Philadelphia, you gotta have a gear. You gotta yeah. be materialistic. And so in my fly girl, she got the gear. Okay. You know I mean? She ain't just good looking and nice and cool. She got the gear. She yeah. got the gear. She yeah. got the juice, baby. She got the she got earrings it. and the necklace. And What's the fly girl your first novel? Chains. No, second novel. Okay. My first novel was a book called Colored on White Campus. I went to Pittsburgh. I wanted to play football like typical black guys want to. And then I became very political, understanding the politics of sports, where a lot of black men, they don't get degrees, but they play sports for right. colleges that make a lot of money off of them. And even when they do get degrees, it's some less than degree because they wanted you focusing on sports and not on your degree. So if you go in there and you try to play basketball, football, you say you want to be a doctor. The coach is like, hey, that's a little too hard. You know, we're going to be traveling a lot. We don't have time. And so typically, they, they don't say it outright, yeah. but they kind of influence you to take weaker subjects okay. so you can be about basketball and football. So you know, just so totally basically, focus on that. Yeah, you got to fight them dudes and say, no, I can handle a real workload and still play football or basketball. And so I wrote that as my first book, Color on White Campus, and all the other stuff you learn at the college level that pissed you off and so I became like radical. If you ever seen Spike Lee's movie School Days, okay. I was like the Lawrence Fishburne character always talking about we need more black just and black I was one of them and so I had to leave black power. Yeah, I had to leave Pittsburgh and go to Howard University, which is the black school, because I couldn't concentrate anymore. I was ready to kill white people every day, you know. And so I and look, it was messing with my focus on a academics. Yeah. I'm thinking about getting the white man, you know what I mean? I'm in class. So I said I, I need to stop focusing on that and go back to the academics and so Howard University allowed me to focus back on the academics. Okay. Yeah. What was your major uh, when you went to Howard? I transferred into journalism. When I was at Pittsburgh, my mother's a pharmacist. I wanted to play football. But there ain't no major called football, right? Right. <laughs> and so I was majoring in pharmacy, which is math and science. And I had a lot of, you know, the uh, credits and stuff in that. But when I got to Howard, I knew by that time, like, I'm a writer. Okay. I do this. I'm good at this. And I had all A's and stuff in writing it at uh, Pittsburgh before I transferred. And everybody was like, yo, dude, you should write books and all that. Yeah. And so when I got to Howard, I transferred into journalism. First, I went to English. I didn't like that. <laughs> Cause they had us reading them a bunch of white books. Yeah. So, so here I go, I transferred from Pittsburgh to a black school and they still had us reading white classics for English. Yeah. And I'm like, yo, dude, like how come all these white books? And so I jumped out of English and went to journalism and journalism is newspaper writing, magazine writing, what you doing right now yeah. is video journalism, production journalism. And so once I went over there, then I was doing articles on other people and gathering more information, which, you know, that's part of my career now. I'm an information gatherer yeah. to do everything I do. And so, yeah, I transferred into journalism uh, half and half. So I'm a half scientist and half journalist. Okay. So a lot of people are like, how you go from math and science to creative <laughs> and writing? So they tell you, that's how complicated. And you know that's I mean? good, though. That was yeah. a good skill to have yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, did you go to school? Did you go to college with any other upcoming authors or, no. you know, music no, nobody. Or When I started talking about writing, black yeah. people, man, I was like, man, you know, I'm going to tell you a story. When I first was writing books, I think like my second or third time going out to Oakland for a tour. Mm -hmm. You know, I had another brother, you know, and he was going to interview me for a magazine. Yeah. So we met at a party, yeah. kicking it. And so I asked him, I said, so how do your friends, you know, talk to you with being a writer? And he's like, come on, man, they think I'm a Martian, man. Like, you know? And he said, they don't do no writing. And so we had a good laugh about it, because it's like, we don't write like that. We don't write, like, even the rappers now, they want to get high and freestyle. Yeah. They don't want to write nothing. Yeah. So that writing, man, we had a good laugh about it. It's just not something that... You know, it, and it's sad to say that, but yeah. we don't brag about writing. It's not important to us in our culture. In fact, we look at the movies, the boy Jordan Peele for the movie Get Out. Yeah. That was the first Black Academy Award for writing. After all the movies, that's the first one. I'm wow. like, are you kidding me? Wow. But that's what it is. If we don't write our own stories, then we don't get the credit for being that. You know, so we had a good laugh about it. But yeah, man, it's like... You know, it's like you the man on the moon, you know what I mean? Like this weird thing, like, you know, and then when you're trying to explain it, you know, now we got more writers now, yeah. cause I inspired a lot of writers. Definitely, you know what I mean? definitely. So now we got a lot more brothers who like, yo, Omar Tyree, I started writing it. And a lot of brothers coming out of jail, like, you know, when I they swear, locked down yes. and writing, 
Yeah. You know, so that, but yeah, for the most part, we still got brothers right now. This new generation, they all into this freestyle thing. Yeah. So writing has gotten thrown out the window again. Where you know that writing is getting high. You know what I mean? You get high, and then these words are gonna come to me out the blue. That's why they just you know. saying anything that don't yeah. even make no damn sense. That's what it we is. gotta make writing sexy again, y'all. Yeah. Look, on this fly girl, I heard that uh, Sanai like that was supposed to play. Well, that was years ago. She was going to play the older role, which is the sequel book. It's by the, For the Love of Money is the sequel book. And then we got, let me see, Boss Lady is in there? Yeah, we don't got Boss Lady in there. Okay. But Boss Lady is a trilogy book. And so what Hollywood does, they didn't want to try and find and introduce some young person to yeah. play the role. And so they felt more comfortable in an older character. Okay. And then Sanai Lady can play that. But when they did the research, uh, Lionsgate had the property uh, at that time. When they did research, they found out that none of the directors and writers and producers wanted to touch the older vehicle because they know the people want the young vehicle. Yeah. And so then they was like, well, we got to write a screenplay for the younger vehicle and figure it out. And they didn't understand how to do it. Yeah. And so a screenplay never got done. I end up writing a screenplay, and then I would choose Yara Shahidi okay. as, as my fly girl. But of course, with something like that, you have to have the capital ready for her, you know, agents and all that to make sure that it's ready to go. Yeah. And so you can talk about who you want, but until you got all the pieces together, nothing gonna move, you yeah. know what I mean, until the money move. Like Rob Kelly said, nothing move but the money. <laughs> you know, so until that money moves in the right way, you know, you can talk about who you want, but you know, you're gonna be waiting. Yeah. Definitely. You seem so detailed about just like everything that you talk about, your yeah. work, your project and everything like that. Are you that, um, do you pay attention to detail that much into like your women, women you have dated in the past? I'm picky. I'm picky. But you got two different things that go on there. You know, you got, you know, people you kick it with. And then when you start to get deeper than that, yeah, that's hard. Yeah. Because, you know, I got attitudes. You know what I mean? So now, like, when my attitude clash with your attitude, I like my freedom. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, I'm done. You know and you're an so, Aries, too. Yeah. So, you know. Like, Aries in the building. Yeah. So my longest relationship was five months. What? Five months. I do not believe it. Yeah. <laughs> until, until my wife, and then, 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 then that was, and then it was like, with that one, it was like, it's cool where I can be me yeah. and she can take it. Because yeah. a lot of girls, they can't take it. I'm like, I can't deal with it. Because if I can't you be me. You were creative. Yeah, so I can't be me. Right. So you find a girl where you can be you and they can take it. And I'm like, cool. Yeah. And then you become like family. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? So, but a lot of them, they can't take it. I'm like, look, I'm not trying to squeeze myself into a box. You, know, you didn't do this and you did that. Like, look, dude, if, if I can't be me, I'm, I'm done with it. Because yeah. it's just too much pressure, man. It's too much can't do that so yeah you gotta have the one that allows you to do you yeah. and then everything's good well with you being an intellectual you know you do need that space for your creative thinking you know you don't need too many distractions around yeah. you and things like that i right? need this and that and this and you didn't do that and you always do it and you always work on a book and you know and i'm like yo man you gonna have to find another dude you know what i mean like you know, and w when you hear that, when Jay-Z talk about being focused, yeah, when you got a focused dude, you got to understand, like, he's doing his thing right now, when he's done, then I'm going to go in there. Yeah. And the girlfriend's be like, girl, you better get in there and tell him, like, look, it's my dude, if he does his thing, then I go and we do our thing. Like, I, I got patience like that. Y'all ain't got, that's why y'all can't get with these kind of dudes. Exactly. You know, so that's the thing. And that open you got a man, you can always attract. You know, on one end, I, I can make him do this, end, but on the other end, that's why he ain't getting nothing That's why he losing. He ain't got <laughs> yeah. no, no he's money. Because easily distracted. Uh -huh. you know? I yeah, need this get new bag, baby. That. Yeah, you get girls that do that. I want that type. And so what happens, like, when girls see they can't distract me, it's a turn off. Yeah. So a lot of times you get them hood girls. I don't like him because I can't get him to, you know, respond to me. You know what I mean? So they don't like me like that. You know what I mean? Like, you know what I'm saying? It could be like, I like his look. I like his attitude. But he don't pay me enough, you know, attention. Yeah. He, he got this other stuff going on. I don't like that. It's intimidating. Yeah, so, you know, so a lot of that. Would you yeah. call yourself a um, sapiosexual? No, I don't even know what that is. Okay, a sapiosexual is somebody who is attracted to the mind first. Like, you know how some people... Oh, okay. Yeah, you know how some people just all no, over the physical... No, no. Uh, you gotta look good. <laughs> hey, you gotta look good too, baby. Oh, your mind is no. 
Yeah, I'm talking about, I got a dad yeah. going to bad. Yeah. And then I'm going to talk to you. Yeah. Oh, she ain't, she an airhead. You know what I mean? Like, well, I'm going to talk to you first off the bat. She dangy as fuck. You know what I mean? <laughs> but the other thing, the insulate, if, if we around each other, I'm like, yo, that girl really smart. She really cool. But that's like secondary. Okay. The physical is still, nah, nah, dude. I'm superficial. I just I had the ass I, I'm not lying to no one out there. I'm ask attracted. To I see stuff first. Like, God. <laughs> and then when you say some airhead stuff, like, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, she's yeah. gonna have about a couple of days. <laughs> she, <laughs> she ain't gonna last long with me. Yeah, that, that ain't gonna last. But physically, I'm like, boy, she's, but I ain't, I ain't got nowhere that I can go with her. Right. But we're gonna have a couple of days. <laughs> I think the women that's probably attracted to you are probably sapiosexual. Probably. Because yeah. they're attracted to I mean, to they, they gonna say, well, he, he's a, he's a, you got the look, you got a nice look, but then they have to be mental because. I come out with that immediately. I mean, so yeah. they get that immediately. Like, I'm not going to act like I'm dumb. I'm not doing that. Right. So when I speak and I say certain things, oh, he want a smart dude. Yeah, I'm not hiding. Yeah. So if you ain't attracted to that, I ain't got no place to go. And that's what happens when a lot of times you like pretty hood girl. Yeah. And they're like, oh, he want a smart dude. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, they, so I'm like, and I'm cool with that. Like, because I'm not going to play dumb dude. Yeah. I'm not, I'm the hell with that. Yeah, if you want a dude to play dumb, go find a dude to do that. Cause, I'm not, I can't, and I'm an Aries, so we don't lie well, right? So, right. Yeah, so I can't fake it anyway, right. so it ain't gonna work. So I'm like, nah, dude, if you can't take me for the intelligence that I have, you can't deal with it, yeah. then we can't, you know, ain't nothing going on. So do you think a lot of guys kind of downplay their intelligence just to get women, like... Not just women, they downplay intelligence for everything, you know what I mean? Like, you know, you ask a dude, yo, what you gonna do in five years? Man, five years, I don't even know what I'm doing tomorrow, man. I just be chilling out here. And it, it sounds stupid as hell. But they stupid. think that's cool. And I'm like, dude, he just asked you what you got. You ain't got no five-year plan. And they think that's cool to say, I don't even know. I go by day by day. And they got friends slapping. And yeah, yeah. I'm like, y'all sound retarded, dude. <laughs> like, you got no plan for five years. Like, that's stupid. That you know, stupid. You know when Jay-Z said, I don't brag about being in the hallways and the projects. That yeah. sounds stupid. Yeah. So you got to tell these young boys, like, yo. That's stupid, cause and that pants hanging down. I'm gonna say it. It's retarded. It is. Y'all wanna see stand dudes asses in front of me? I'm at the damn post office. I'm walking them down. I don't wanna see your ass. I right. feel like putting my boot in your ass. Every, I'm sick of it, man. And they think it's cool. It's like, dude, it ain't cool. Pull your fucking pants up. Yeah. Excuse my point. No, you Pull your it. pants up, man. Let me tell you something. I, I, I was in New York. This is like 2004. Me and my homie, Big Bronze, from Charlotte with me. We up there doing business in New York. We stopped at a light. And the dude had to cross the street with his pants hanging down. I swear to God. He pulled his pants up five times, crossing from this side of the street. To, and I'm sitting there like, what the hell is that? Why are you going? And I'm going to tell you another story. I, I forgot my belt when I was running out the house one time for an interview, yeah. and I had to walk a little bit. I damn near lost my mind just trying to, like, because you, I'm thinking about other stuff, not pulling my pants up. Right. Uh, I told him, like, how do these dudes do? It's too distract. I talked about focus earlier. You can't focus by pulling your pants up. 18th, it's, it's retarded. So they already showing you how unfocused they are. They're easy targets. It's crazy. They're easy targets. It's crazy. All is and it's jail. And, yeah. It's actually jail, you know, culture. You know, because yeah. they don't allow you to have belts in jail because it becomes a weapon. Yeah. You can hang people. You can choke people. Mm -hmm. So you don't have belts in jail. So they got this loose thing going to jail. So they come out of jail with this whole loose pants thing. Yeah. It's also easy access if you want to get, you know, taken to. Clearly. You know, so they're not getting that part. They're not understanding. Mm -hmm. That's what they, they send in the city. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or the other side, I'm so rough, I can pull my pants down, and you ain't gonna take my behind. But you still pushing the, that type of, you know what I mean? Like, you gonna get your you ass still beat trying that. to hold your pants You're up. still pushing that. So, I mean, they gotta understand that, but it became a trend where they're doing it all the time. Yeah. Again, man, like, you know, sorry getting on a tangent on it's that. It's all good. <laughs> I understand. Look, yeah. I understand. So, um, how do you think we could get more men, especially black men, to reading. Like, Put them in jail? <laughs> clearly, that's where they got time to they read. Got I can remember, like, I used to date a guy, and every time he would take me out to eat, he would look at the menu or whatever, but he would always end up ordering chicken wings. I'm like, damn, can this motherfucker read? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> you don't order nothing every time? I swear. And that just made me wonder, like, is dudes really out here, like, they can't read? Like, what's going yeah. on? I'm some guys can't read, and reading, you gotta understand that reading is visualization. You gotta have a vocabulary. Yeah. 
So when you read words and you know what it means, you see the word. Mm -hmm. And so I have this speech I do called the five key components of literacy. I think I saw you know, that one. Reading yeah. is taking in information. Mm -hmm. And so physically you're watching stuff, you read, that's reading. Yeah. So I'm from the hood in Philadelphia. I'm reading everything. Um, <laughs> everything yes. that moves, you yes. know, because it's safety. Yes. You know what I mean? You can't be slipping and sleeping and you're in the hood. Yeah. You got to read every person to make sure they ain't trying yeah, to do right. something. That's real. Yeah, so that's reading. And then writing is when we speak. Okay. You got them shy and bashful people. We ain't got time for that in Philadelphia. You got to say what you're saying, you're not, because we got them tight row houses. You got to speak your piece. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's shot. Writing is, is the talking, the communication is writing. And then the thinking component, which you like to talk about yeah. a lot, you know, thinking is everything. Yeah. Everything you do and say and react is thinking. How, how you think, how you process the information. And then visualization is how you see the future, the past, the present, and all that. Mm -hmm. And that's what we talk about. Words allow you to visualize what it is you're reading. Okay. And so if I give people a sentence, the boy jumped over the moon and landed in the lake. Mm. You have to know what each word means. The boy jumped <laughs> over the moon yeah. and landed in, in the, the lake. lake. You can see that. Yeah. This is what happens to illiterate people. If you don't know what a boy is, and you don't know what jumping is, and you don't know what over is, you don't know what the moon is, you don't know what landing right. is, right. you don't know what a lake okay. is, you don't see anything. Yeah. So that's the turn off to you, like, I don't get that. So now you get girls that have a vocabulary, and they laughing and crying, and, and just from a book. And the guy looking at you like, what the hell are you doing? I'm reading, I can visualize what's going on because I have a vocabulary. Wow. But if you don't have a vocabulary, you don't know what the hell is going on in that <laughs> book. And you need pictures to show you what's going on. Yes. And so they want videos and they want movies because they don't have a vocabulary because they don't read enough. Yes. And so when Malcolm X first started reading in jail, the first thing he had to do is sharpen his vocabulary with the dictionary so he could understand what the hell was the words that meant something. Wow. That's the problem. Wow. You got a lot of illiterate dudes and they're embarrassed by it. They won't ask for help. Mm -hmm. So they don't know what the hell is going on with it. So they don't like reading because they don't know what the words mean. Wow. And it's sad, but I understand exactly what that is. Mm -hmm. It's a lack of the last four components Bible, rather is application. They can't apply the skills because they don't have them. Right. And it's sad. But it they, they won't tell you that, that they don't know the definition uh -huh. of the word. But at some point along, when they stop paying attention to reading and all that, it's just practice. Yeah. If you don't practice words and understand what they mean, you fall out of practice. You, you rusty now. Yeah. So now if you rusty, you don't know what the hell it is. Now you back away from it. Well, I ain't good at that. You know, I ain't good at the reading stuff. I ain't good. So a lot of times when men meet me and they know I'm a writer, they immediately apologize. Mm. Out of guilt. Hey man, I ain't read none of your books, man. I'm sorry, man. I don't, I don't read like that, bro. And I, I'm like, I'm like, it's cool, man. It's cool. But they already feel guilty because yeah. they know they don't read. You know what I mean? And yeah. then they always put it off when you write all them girl books in there. Actually, I got more masculine books than feminine books. Mm -hmm. But y'all do all the reading, so all the feminine books come to the forefront with yeah. the masculine books. They don't get the same weight, mm -hmm. you know? Even the books I had to order, they had more orders for the feminine books than the masculine books. Okay. So the masculine books are what they call um, print on demand. Okay. They cost more. <laughs> so for the masculine books, like, why well, I got to pay 25 out? Because we don't get that many orders for the, the masculine yeah. book. So now I got to pay more. So I'm like, I ain't, I ain't going to make no money off of that. So now, even economically, you're going to make more money off a book that's selling because they print it more versus a book that's not selling. Because wow. when they got to print a brand new book that ain't selling, then it costs them more to print because they're not printing it on a regular. Yeah. See, you know? guys, so even that, you guys are costing authors. Dudes are costing authors to have to spend more. I'm yeah. sorry. Dudes are costing authors to have to spend more money because they don't have the time to guys don't want to read. Yeah. I think um, that turned guys away from even like yeah, even children's books. I got a children's book called 12 Brown Boys. Okay. It's a boys book. And when I was shopping it to publishers, they looked at me like I was crazy. They were like, well, you know, black boys don't read, right? How come you write for this book? And I got two sons. I got two little brothers. I'm as boy as they come. So when people see his interview, like, he's very masculine. Yeah. And so now, I'm sitting there in front of children's book people, and they telling me to write little girl books. 
So I'm like, yo, dude, I'm trying to get boys and they're like, dude, dude, we're not putting our money. So I couldn't convince anybody to put this book out. Then a black publisher put it out, uh, Just Us Books in New Jersey. We couldn't sell 10,000 copies. Now, with my women's books, 200,000, 300,000, 800,000, yes. we couldn't sell 10,000 copies of a children's book that cost $5. What? $5. Moms are now saying, well, he can get the book from the library. I ain't got to buy that book. But they'll go buy McDonald's. They'll go buy the, 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 the different uh, uh, video games. They'll buy the sneakers and the clothes. They'll buy all that. You know what I mean? But they won't buy a book. So, I mean, that's what she's fighting against. You know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's atrocious, but that's what we're dealing with. Yeah. So, how do you think we can make reading sexy again or make it great again for our black men? I don't know, you know, you got me, man, because, I, I mean, I've been in this game nearly 30 years, and the only time they read is when you lock them in jail or a teacher has to make it mandatory reading in the classroom. And so we have to do that, make it mandatory reading in the class. That's the only way, you know what I mean? Other than that, you know, they're still not going to want to read on their own. So you got, now you make it. Uh, mandatory reading that maybe they'll pick up stuff that they like because yeah. the boys that actually read 12 brown boys they love it but you got to enforce them to read it yeah. first okay yeah. and I'm not trying to make it a race thing or anything but do you think uh, white men read more than black oh definitely no question about it you know what I mean they on airplanes more yeah. and I get to see them more and when they on airplanes, they read. Okay. You know, magazine books. Now they still gonna read different books. They're yeah. reading business books. Yeah. They're reading self help books. They're reading biography books. They're not reading a lot of fiction, okay. but they do read more, definitely. But they're still read more professional work more than they read creative books. Have you ever thought about writing like a self help book? Maybe that'll get black men to read again. You know what I mean? Not really, you know what I mean? I, I had a book, uh, a business book I wrote called The Equation, okay. Five Indisputable Components of Success. And I had a couple other books I wanted to write, but again, the capital that you're gonna make right now, I had an agent like, Omar, you're not gonna make the money that we making writing the other, so it's now a drop down between making 250,000 versus 50,000. Yeah. You done lost $200,000, you know, so in the prime of my career, you know, I'm like, I'm not trying to go into somewhere. And even my agent was like, that's not going to make the same money that you used to make. It. Yeah. You know, so I haven't had a whole lot of uh, nonfiction ideas for self-help. But I had books, ideas that I wanted to write from a journalistic perspective. Like uh, Turning Pro was a book I wanted to do with black men turning pro in sports. Okay. And even college early and all that kind of stuff. I like that. That was back in 1996 when Tiger Woods started playing professional golf. Okay. And Allen Iverson, you know, left school early from Georgetown. He was the first student to leave Georgetown early. Everybody else is graduated. Yeah. And so he kind of broke the mold of leaving school early. That year, the NBA, 1996, 19 underclassmen. Well, that was a record back then. Now it's normal. They got this one and done thing where they do a freshman year and leave. Yeah. You see? So they never finish in school. They never finish. And so yeah, it's, it's hard. You know what I mean? Definitely. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, so you from Philly. Do you know how to make a, an original Philly cheesesteak? An original Philly t-shirt? Cheesesteak. Cheesesteak. Have I ever... Che oh, cheesesteak. Yeah. You know how to make a Philly cheesesteak? What about it? That's why I'm asking you. Have I one chop it up? Yeah. Well, I think what happens with other people, you got to chop the steak up. So y'all all do steaks, but you got to chop it up. Okay. You know, a lot of times they have this big, fat, one piece, big piece steak. No, we got to chop them up. Okay. Yeah, and then you put the onions in there and anything else, and then it works. That's what's up. Do you yeah. cook for your women or your woman? No. I, I cook what? breakfast. I cook breakfast. But he I cooked no breakfast. Cook. Yeah. Okay. Breakfast cook. Okay. <laughs> I like that. Do you got your own apron with your name and no, cursor? No, I ain't no, no apron. No. That's what's up. Okay, so we finna wrap it up. Um, we got some people here. He's doing yeah, a sip and sign. Yeah, we got a sign. sign books. We're in St. Louis. We are at the Revenge of the Nerds Comics and Collectibles in Fairview Heights. All and we got Tyree. a new film coming, Monologue. So check out my Instagram, only one, the number one, Omar Tyree. Twitter is Omar Tyree. Facebook is Omar Tyree. YouTube. Uh, what else we got? LinkedIn, we got all that stuff. Are you Just on LinkedIn too? Yeah, I'm okay. on LinkedIn too. I like that. Monologues, the movie coming. Monologue, y'all checking out. Film. 
Dime Davis presents Talk Your Spit. It's your girl Dime Davis with my new friend, Omar Tyree, New York Times bestselling author, y'all. You got it. Dime, peace. <laughs>